not all of us can do the work from Instagram, okay? I think we all know the work from Instagram. The work from Instagram is basically the beautiful model sitting on the rock with the beach background on the laptop, logging into a marketing career. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of the real estate world. And I tell you what, I've cracked my own code. I broke my arm on the weekend. Today, I'm coming to you with a massive cast on my arm. So if you're watching on YouTube, do apologize for the way I look. Look like I've run out of a hospital. But today, we're going to explore some fascinating concepts when it comes to owning real estate, investing in real estate, and of course, the future of real estate. The reality is we no longer live in the physical world, and we are actually passing into the digital world. We are in a new economic era. We are in the digital world. Yes, the digital world. Today, this podcast is about building wealth through the digital age, a new age that we have never actually encountered before. Your parents never passed through the digital age. Your grandparents never came to the digital world. This is a completely new place to be. It began with coronavirus, but it won't end with a vaccine. Things have changed. They have changed forever. And today on the podcast, we're going to go through some of these significant behavioral changes to see how they'll influence your decision making when it comes to property, coronavirus, and of course, where potentially you need to own assets into the future of being a real estate investor. Of course, coronavirus has shaken up the jobs market, it has created a real problem economically for many businesses. It has allowed innovation to occur at a rapid rate. Innovative ideas, which would normally take a decade, even two decades, have been fast-tracked in a matter of weeks. Pivoting businesses are actually reframing how society will work, where people can make a living, where economies will unfold. The beneficiary of changing economies, of course, is property investors that have a real comprehension of behavioral economics. Today, I want to give you some behavioral ideas of what will occur into the future as we pass through the digital age, neither in the physical nor in the digital. So we have heard the rhetoric that cities are finished, that people are going to go live off a laptop and go and live anywhere in the world and basically do business. Is it a little bit far-fetched? What is the real truth? Today, more than 22 million people live in urban Australia. Australia only has 25 million people, yet 22 million of us live in big places, bigger cities, cities like Newcastle or the Gold Coast or Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane or Perth, our cities washed up. Is the transformation of workplace actually going to recalibrate society to move in different migrational patterns? Well, I think we can all agree the shakeup is interesting and it will have some effects on what is going to happen and where. But I think it's a little bit far-fetched to think that there's going to be 5 million people exiting Sydney because Sydney is an expensive place. Sydney is also an awesome place. It's got great beaches. It's got great nightlife. It's got great arts and culture, as does Melbourne, as does Brisbane. One thing we do know about the history of our cities is is the older they are, the more interesting they are, the more arts and culture they bring to community, and the more 
history they have around community so people don't necessarily abandon their local rugby team or their bowling club just because a virus comes along. I think we need to ground the conversation with Australia has a business plan. It does want to grow its cities, its regional cities, its bigger cities. So as a property investor, it is an interesting paradigm as to understanding potentially where we should invest our money, our time, our effort. Has coronavirus changed the game forever or is it simply a little bit of a tweak as to understanding where we should invest? Melbourne will have 8 million people by 2050. Sydney, 8 million people. Brisbane, 5 million people. These are big cities by world standards and are going to be cities where people will continue to to go to and use. The trend of cities is all about people, innovation, ideas, all combining together at a blistering pace to create outcomes, to create purpose. And I think though many of us, including myself, are working from home, the idea of uh, collaborating with other people is still very important. The social structure of human beings is not to live isolated. It is to combine together to think through big problems and solve them together. They can be economic, social. They can be problems with the environment. But we, as society, will continue to come together and we will continue to come together in big cities. But we are now not in just the digital world, we are also in the physical world, which we are in the digital world. Half of our life is digital now, and for many people, half of it is still physical. Now, we are in what I would call an age of responsive real estate. Because we're digital, because we're physical, real estate is having to change to adapt to both those needs. Once upon a time, the need was just physical. You would get up and go to a workplace. That was a physical maneuver. You would then go home and try and live close enough to that workplace because your physical self had to come and go from it. Today, that is still the case, but we are also seeing the digital world. People being able to wake up, walk downstairs, put their pants on, have some wheat bags and turn on a Zoom and have a chat. So what impact does that really have? Where does that take us as a human species? How does that transform economics? Digital economics is real and there are three parts to the puzzle. The decentralizing of society which I'll talk about, the wealth effect, which will unfold by virtual government, and of course, livability, which I have talked a lot about in past episodes. Hot property will be livable areas. If you can live in the digital world in a livable area, how valuable is your real estate going to be? If you can pop into an office, collaborate with people, yet work two or three days from home, in a very livable place where you can sit on a rock and enjoy the sun and put your feet in the water, but go back to your home, which is set up from work from home dynamics, you are living the dream. The new pyramid of livability is digital, digital, and livable, which is an incredible statement. See, a lot of people will realize that they are not living in the most livable neighborhood and working from home, being stuck in that digital space, actually means that they're having to look around where they live a lot more. And for some people, that'll mean migrating. That'll mean taking off to the Gold Coast and living a better life. 
But for other people who have assets in livable neighborhoods, they have the trifecta of future wealth creation in real estate. Digital, digital, livable. And it's going to absolutely uh, game change people's results in real estate. So welcome to the age of responsive real estate. Does your real estate respond to the new world, the digital world? And if it doesn't, well, the argument is it's certainly not going to be the first choice of the value chain when it comes to consumer purchasing. So will people migrate out of big cities into smaller regional communities? Well, as touched on in past episodes, I don't think we're going to see a huge change in how people relate to cities. Sydney is still more a fun place than Wollongong. It is. Uh, It's still more amazing than the Gold Coast. Let's face it, I'm probably going to anger people by saying that, but it is. There's a lot of culture in our biggest cities. And when it comes to moving money, we as property investors have decisions to make. Now, people often ask me, you know, how do I determine my decision making when it comes to investment in cities? We hear a lot of rhetoric that regional markets are going to go up and because people are leaving cities to to buy in regional communities. And that is absolutely true. So how regional do you go? And how do you analyze cities from the top down? I use a top down strategy. Australia has two global cities, Sydney and Melbourne. Sydney and Melbourne, top down, is these cities are the apex predator of real estate. So as a property investor, because lending is difficult, You don't want to put yourself in a position where you wake up in 2042 and not own real estate in Sydney or Melbourne. The reason is they are big cities. They will always be big cities and people will always live in them. Now, they are the apex predator of Australian real estate. So the first choice, if you can afford it, is based on the cycle you know, Melbourne or Sydney. Second choice is what we call a new world city. A new world city is a city which attracts innovation. It attracts new industries. It attracts lots of multinational companies moving there because it is an attraction magnet. It attracts people from all over the world wanting to migrate to those cities. New world cities are places like Brisbane and Perth in Australia, places like Berlin in Europe. They are an attraction magnet. So I start with global. If I can't afford global, I go to new world. I look at which city is carrying the best opportunity in its cycle. Then you move to primate cities Cities which are the biggest in their region, places like Hobart or Canberra, are the biggest for their communities. Then you can move down to what we call feeder cities. Feeder cities are cities next door to major cities. The economies are interlinked. Newcastle feeds off Sydney. Bendigo feeds off Melbourne. Ballarat feeds off Melbourne. Wollongong feeds off Sydney, Toowoomba feeds off Brisbane. The Gold Coast feeds off Brisbane. Feeder cities, they are part of the community of the major city. Now, what we will see as a result of coronavirus and digital economics is feeder cities are probably going to do pretty well. The Gold Coast is probably going to do pretty well, as is Newcastle, because people will wake up and go... 
I tell you what, I can work from anywhere right now. And because I can work from anywhere, I'm going to go and live in Newcastle. Or I'm going to go and live in the Gold Coast. However, we do have other places to go and live. Regional cities, regional town centres, small towns or dying towns. Small towns are like, you know, wee war. I mean, is anyone really going to leave Sydney to go and live in wee war? Regional town centres, places like Coffs Harbour, Port Macquarie, I think you'll find that they still lack the basic level of community and infrastructure and, and fun that really means people won't leave cities for these kind of regional town centre places in droves. Sure, they might receive a little bit of growth, but long term, you will find that you want to have your money in global or new world cities, primate cities, or even feeder cities. These are the places where I love looking for real estate. Remember, Australians live in cities and we will always continue to do so. However, the workplace is decentralizing and we now have almost like the best of both worlds. Once upon a time, we all had to go to work in the CBD if we were office workers and it was a bit of a grind. Now, 50% of our time can be spent at home, working from home, and 50% of our time in offices collaborating. There is going to be a use for both. And I think you'll find as the pendulum swings, you can't go just completely one way, completely digital, because that does create collaboration, isolation, but also the idea that offices are an expensive fixed cost for particularly businesses. So removing that cost is absolutely cracking when it comes to the viability of business. Now, I think we're also going to see, obviously, retail be heavily impacted through the digital world. Retail really does summarise the digital dynamic that a lot of our shopping now is simply done by ordering online. I know I haven't been to a supermarket in forever. When it comes to ordering online, I find the two big trends which are occurring is basics are being done online. But old retail is done for the good old-fashioned retail experience. It's done for fun. It's entertainment. So retail is morphing from being where you need to go to to collect something, if it's just a collection sale, you generally will now do that online. But if it's for some therapy, for some social engagement, you'll still want to go and experience a store, try on a dress if you're a girl, try on some shoes, meet your maid, have a coffee, do this kind of dynamic around retail. So retail is going to have a different footprint. And I think you will find the best footprint of that will still be in our CBD locations and our malls where people can still go and get that therapy that sometimes retail offers. But we will see the logistics of retail change from offering both. Retail is digital. It is going to be smaller outlets. It's going to be more niche areas to find those outlets. And I think what you'll find is the cascading effect 
of retail will shrink to the good old days where people actually went into the city to shop. And that was behaviorally changed many, many moons ago where we took retail out to suburbia. Suburban retail will shrink and I think what you will find is the retail in the city will remain the place where most shops are for the experience because after all, I think a lot of people do enjoy a day out wandering around the city, uh, enjoying that kind of retail dynamic which is pretty good. We are going to see smaller offices. The footprint of offices is changing. We're going to see businesses which really can offer their staff the opportunity to both work from home but also collaborate in a smaller yet funkier kind of office. So whereas one business might have needed a 1,000 square metres to fit its team, today you'll find that might only be 200 or 300 square metres And because of the behavioural change of offices, that 300 square metres is going to be really half the price as to what it once cost per square metre. So the office market will stay and it's going to be a lot less expensive than it once was, which is fantastic for business because business always struggled with two major things, the overhead of people and the overhead of place. The composition of the office market will absolutely change. And I think you'll find that, again, the effect of cheaper office rent will reframe how cities work. Now, how the office market typically works so that you can understand the conversation around digital economics. The office market typically works with, in the CBD, let's take Sydney CBD for example, the CBD itself has places which are prime office market areas. So Sydney CBD is the top dog. Inside Sydney CBD, there are three areas which rank from best to worst. The best is Barangaroo. Barangaroo is now the number one office area of Sydney. It's a new area and it replaced the financial hub, which was Martin Place. Martin Place, previously to Barangaroo coming, was number one. So we've seen this before. What happens when there's office change is there's a migration effect of how the worth of offices unfolds. So before Brangaroo, Martin Place was the top dog. Along comes Brangaroo and now that's the top dog. So what you often see is the transformation of big business. So now big business is leaving Martin Place and going to Barangaroo. So that creates opportunities for up-and-coming businesses to go to Midtown, to Barangaroo. They typically come from around in Sydney, Town Hall and Central. So Town Hall and Central is typically the third place that you would have a business if you are the hierarchy of top dog to bottom dog. So all of a sudden, Midtown moves to Barangaroo, Uptown being Town Hall, and Central moves to Midtown being Martin Place. So that creates office opportunities for people in Town Hall and Central. Where do they come from? Well, all of a sudden you see the migration from places like North Sydney. So then people move from North Sydney to the city. So what happens to North Sydney? You start to see people move from Artama and St. Leonard's, Chatswood to, to, uh, to, to North Sydney. See, the flow and effect of office markets actually carries all the way out 
to as far as you can go for Sydney itself. Because if you want to attract new business and you need an office environment to do that, if you want to attract talent and you want to grow talent, you can do that in an office environment. And the more central you are, the more talent you can create, the more talent you can attract. Now, let me put that in the physical world. In the physical world, if you had an office at Bella Vista, which is uh, sort of northwest Sydney, probably about 35, 40 kilometers from the CBD, you're not going to attract talent from the eastern suburbs of Sydney or the southern suburbs of Sydney. It's too far away to get to. However, if you got yourself to North Sydney or to Sydney in the office market, you would attract talent and open your talent pool up. In other words, you could almost attract better workers which create more productivity for your business, which creates more business revenue, which makes your business bigger, faster and better. So the office market is changing. The footprints are opening up. The cost to own an office is absolutely plummeting in value. This is going to create so much opportunity for the migration of the office marketplace. Are offices finished? Absolutely not. Remember, we're living half our life life in the digital world, or sorry, in the physical world, and half our life in the digital world. So the collaboration of an office in the CBD is going to be absolutely important for the fibre of many businesses. And this is going to, again, create an opportunity where the better CBDs of cities will outperform the satellite areas of office dynamics. We will probably see the centralized, decentralized of many C-grade office marketplaces. They just simply won't exist into the future. But the A-grade market will exist. And here's a really important thing to understand. Being seen is very important in some industries. Going to an office and being seen is important for people's growth. Younger people need to be seen to be sometimes acknowledged that they can be the person of the future, that they can get the pay rise, that they can get the job that will grow into the future. The digital world is great, but the challenge with the digital world for many people who are not fixed in their job and have not been in their job for 10 years, are not well known in their community, is the digital world will actually be hard for people to be seen new up and comers and the beautiful thing about the normal physical world is the collaboration of being seen and i think you'll find particularly as companies come out of coronavirus that again you're going to see this kind of workplace of collaboration Come in and be seen. Let's see where we can take this business together. That kind of approach. I think you'll find that some smaller businesses with, say, 20 or 30 employees, talent, are able to work in the digital world really functionally because fundamentally all 30 of them can, as a wolf pack, move together. As a business gets more complicated and there's more departments and there's more people, some businesses have 20,000 people in them. It's just not practical for a complete work from home dynamic to ever occur. What we are seeing 
in the digital world is really the WeWorks situation unfold. WeWorks, of course, was a massive business, uh, is a massive business when it comes to shared convenience for workers, office workers working together. So the collaboration idea that really people just need to come together to spitball ideas and bring those ideas creatively to market. And sometimes in the digital world that can work, but also in the digital in the in the physical world, it's really, really important. So WeWork's model, if you don't know it, is small businesses, instead of hanging out at home, they come to a central place. They all work from their laptop and it's centered around things like coffee shops and Tim Tam Tuesday and people get the sense of being part of a community which stimulates them to grow even further. I think it's fair to say a lot of the office market for smaller to medium-sized businesses, say less than 50 employees, will go into their own version of the WeWorks model. Whether that's actually joining WeWorks or whether that's a self-created WeWork model. I know, for example, in my business, we are going into the self-created WeWork model. So we will work from home. We'll have one, uh, maybe two maximum offices around the globe, but we'll also catch up on regular basis using community-based uh, platforms like coffee shops and, and, and bars and things like that just to stay in touch, okay? A lot of businesses are doing that. They are going from a centralized place where they met every day to decentralized digital and physical, a combination of the two, which is really interesting to see unfold. But I tell you what, big businesses with thousands of staff will embrace the idea of both office work and, of course, uh, work from home. And being seen is important. Not all of us can do the work from Instagram, okay? I think we all know the work from Instagram. The work from Instagram is basically the beautiful model sitting on the rock with the beach background, on on the laptop, uh, you know, logging into a marketing career. Now, sounds great. A lot of people will vlog and travel the world doing this kind of concept. I can work from anywhere, don't need shoes, just cruise around in my van with, uh, you know, with, with uh, my chai latte and do my laptop. In the last census, around 4% of Australians work from home and a very smaller percentage worked from anywhere. And the next phase of evolution of society in the digital world is not this sort of work from everywhere. No one's going to like go, oh, yep, now I can go and live in Seminyak, Bali and work from my, my laptop. It's not going to happen because we are not completely in the digital world and we have not left completely the physical world We are in the digital world, which means more people will work from home. I think you'll find from next census that a lot of people will be digital. It's the evolution of society, half-half, working from home two days a week, going to an office three days a a week. The future office is going to be a blended workplace. It's going to be completely blended between physical and digital. And I also think that there is the conversation around, well, the blended world is the future, but does that mean someone's going to go and live three hours in a smaller city away from the office marketplace because they can work from home one or two days a week? It doesn't really work like that. I think we need to comprehend there is also community at play. People have friends, they have family, 
the number one reason people don't leave a city is family. People want to be close to their parents. People want to be close to their community. They play rugby on a Saturday in a rugby team they've played for for 10 years. They don't up and leave that stuff readily. So we are going to see into the future more people work from home. Some surveys out show that some businesses expect at least one day a week people working from home and around 70% of businesses believe that. And why? It actually creates more economic productivity. Commuting three days a week versus five days a week is great for society. It's great for society for a couple of reasons. The biggest reason is the carbon footprint. When we as a society congest our cities, we create a lot of environmental damage. The fact that all of a sudden, two days a week, people can work from home and three days a week, people can move, means we need less trains. It means we need less uh, connectivity around mobility, which is going to be awesome for the planet. It's also going to be awesome for people's lives. They get to spend a little bit more time with their family, with their wife. You'll things see things like divorce rates drop because people get to spend more time building community as opposed to the rat race, which is just wake up, go to work, slog it out, come home, never see the wife, never see... Uh, the girlfriend, the boyfriend, and all of a sudden you've got this kind of social dynamic impact. Of course, it can go the other way where people absolutely hate each other and they'll work that stuff out pretty thick and fast. And I think into the future you'll find your best friend might actually be your wife because like workplaces, you create best friends with people you work with And that'll start to create some really interesting social activity. But it does then pose the conversation that we will have less need for movement because we are fidgetal, less interstate business trips because we can Zoom. One of the biggest things that's changed my life about the digital economic era is less business trips. I don't need to travel to Melbourne as much. I don't need to travel to Brisbane as much. This has allowed me to create hobbies like mountain biking, which I just broke my arm, but coronavirus broke my arm. I've just worked it out. If I was not in the digital world, I would have been in Melbourne. I never would have ridden the bike. See, all of a sudden we're getting our time back and this is an amazing, amazing dynamic which is a real win from the digital world. Now, there are some studies which are coming out and they're coming out all the time at the moment that the office and the home place are better for some things and worse for others. So it's actually better at home when it comes to interference and distractions. Anyone who's ever worked in an office will tell you sometimes they are the most distracting places you can ever go to. The productivity of working from an office is very, very low. Why? Because... Jono wants to go and get a coffee. And then Wendy wants to go and look at some shoes. And then Bob wants to throw a piece of paper at your head. This is what happens in workplaces. There's a lot of banter and friendship which occurs. So from a productivity level of interruptions, working from home is better because you've actually got no one interrupting you for the most part. However, for innovation, for thinking, for collaborating on, uh, on ideas, 
uh, the office is better because you can sit down with things, you can draw things on the whiteboard, you can really pull out value bombs out of people's headspace. And in the digital world, it is a little bit more difficult to do that. Innovation is better in the physical world than the digital world. So there are some winners and some losers. I think what you're think what you're saying is that coaching and mentoring is actually a little bit better managed at the office. Collaborating is better managed at the office, but less distractions, more productivity is much better at home. Hence, we now live in a digital world where the best of both worlds will come together. Very interesting place that uh place to be in in society now the other thing i think we can sort of adapt to is there are a few types of people out there so there are introverts and extroverts extroverts absolutely hate working from home introverts absolutely love working from home no one bothering them extroverts get energy from other people so they like to be around other people to produce the best version of of themselves the digital world does not really help the extrovert get that energy from other people and of course some people like to de separate their lives some people like the idea of compartments that you leave work at work you then leave or enjoy home at home friends of friends you don't combine the two and of course, uh, the idea of separating that is pretty normal. Some people are struggling with the idea that you can't separate work and home. So people are waking up at six in the morning and starting on their emails when that's not necessarily a healthy dynamic to understand. So pretty interesting. So smaller cities and getting out of the rat race will occur people will do the runner because now they've got smaller businesses where they can work in the digital world without having to be part of the greater rat race and we've been seeing this for years this is not a new concept and smaller businesses have already been able to decentralize from bigger cities to do this if you've got a business of three people you're already probably doing this. You're not engaged with the office market at all. A lot of people have already done the Byron Bay experience to go and sort of live and work in this kind of like really livable community as opposed to, you know, living in an undesirable part of a big city uh, for no benefit. So smaller cities will be a winner out of digital economics. But I think we shouldn't lose our minds here and run off and buy real estate in regional areas left, right and centre. Because the rat race of our big cities just got easier. People don't have to move as much. People don't have to go to work as much. The future is potentially 50% less movement around a city. If you can imagine we have our big, big buildings in the city and only 50% of the workers need to now go to those city to, to that city. So that's 50% people, uh, less people on the road, 50% less people on the train, 50% less people moving around. So this now creates a new way of thinking about real estate because all of a sudden the challenge of driving around or getting on the train is a lot easier. It doesn't necessarily mean a shitty place is going to be more livable. It probably will never be more livable. 
but it does create more access for people to go and enjoy some livable areas for a small percentage of time. The argument now is owning real estate next to the train station was once a big priority because you had to get on the train quickly. But in the same suburb, is it now better to own real estate next to the park because you're going to be working from home and the idea of going to another place for some exercise or a break is now the value proposition. You still want to use the train because you're going to use it two or three times a week, but now you want to use the park two or three times a week. So the big fight in real estate is about accessibility. And accessibility is broken down into two areas, mobility and proximity. And I've been teaching this for a very long time. If you want to bet on something in real estate to create wealth, to crack the code of real estate, you bet on mobility and proximity, both of them together. Proximity is proximity or a distance to local things that are accessible. So proximity to the coffee shop, proximity to the park, proximity to the local dog park, right? This is what you bet on. Mobility is the movement of people. Mobility is going to now get easier. So you still bet on it, but at one point mobility was the biggest decision-making concept of people's minds. And a lot of people bet on mobility but didn't bet on proximity. you got to bet on both is what I'm saying. And the future of livability is around both of these things. A lot of people just bet on mobility. Oh, I'll, I'll buy 40 kilometers away from the city because it's got the train line. Okay, well, that's great. That's mobility tick. That means you can go to work two or three times a week on the train, which is great tick. But proximity to nothing, not close to beautiful bushlands, not close to beautiful beaches, not close to culture, arts, not close to the CBD where there's more things to do like festivals and, uh, and uh, markets and things like that. So you got to bet on both because the world is being reframed through both logic, okay? Here is some real dynamics, right? 86% of people right now are living in fear of losing their job. 86% of people are living in fear of losing their job. So people aren't going to up and leave where they currently live to go somewhere they don't know anyone or anything about where there's less job opportunities. I think we need to keep our head here that bigger cities are still where the jobs are. In Australia, there are 19 different sectors of industry. Our bigger cities, global cities, have the most. And as we peel back the layers to our smaller regional areas, they have less. So we need to understand that proximity, mobility, and jobs are going to be a big element of future, future economics. I mean, the MCG can fit more people at a game of cricket than Ballarat has in its city. That's, that's what we're talking about here. You know, 100,000 people in Ballarat, 100,000 people can go to the MCG to watch cricket, right? But we are going to see, without question drivable communities that are close to our cities that feed off them go up in value. And I think you'll find that the prestige end of those cities really does jump in value. If you can go and buy a $1.5 million beautiful home with some acreage where you can have a llama, you're going to see that value proposition rise in value. If you can have a llama 
your real estate is going to go up. If you can have an alpaca, your real estate is going to go up because people will opt for a bit of this sort of sizable tree change and the ex-urbanization will occur for wealthy people who can opt to travel to the city two or three days a week uh, but also go home to something that is extremely awesome. You're already seeing that in places like Sydney and Barrel where people own beautiful homes, can travel two times a week to the CBD for the board meeting and back home again to their, you know, llama and alpaca on their beautiful big uh, hobby kind of rural property which is amazing, right? So ex-urbanization will occur, it will happen, and you are going to see it. Will people flee to regional properties to buy the weird run-down uh, cottage for $300,000 that is you know, cold, old, and 85 years old, as opposed to paying $450,000 to live in cities? I think you'll see the value economics really isn't there for that many people to, to, to leave. And I certainly think from an investment point of view, bigger cities have bigger horsepowers. Now, I always like explain it like this. Imagine a boat with two outboard motors at the back and they're 450 you know, see, uh, horsepower motors. That's Sydney, that's Melbourne. Now think about a city like the Gold Coast. It's probably got 100 cc's on the back. Now think about a city like Toowoomba. It's got 50 cc's on the back. So the smaller you go, the less horsepower those cities have, which is one of the reasons why I like the idea of starting with the top and moving our way down. You start with global, you go to new world cities, you go to primate cities and feeder cities. Remember, if you do decide to invest in regional communities, just understand how to lock in your equity if they do go up because they do tend to bounce around. Hey, that's the first part of the fidgetal puzzle. Today, I'm going to sign off with part one done which is understanding how the new world of offices will connect with each other, what it really means for society, what it really means for us living in the digital world. I hope you've enjoyed the episode. Next episode, we will crack on to some other parts of understanding how the digital world will unfold, the wealth effect, and of course how livability will transform society and who the winners and losers of the office market being transformed will be. I hope you've enjoyed the show. I've certainly enjoyed bringing it to you. Until next time, I'm Sam Saggers signing off and I'll see you next time cracking some more codes of the real estate world. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.